It is Monday, January 17th at 5.01 p.m. The Board of Commissioners of the Hard Rock Electric Department are meeting. All commissioners, uh, we are meeting on Zoom. Um, all commissioners are present. Um, and um, Beth Essery and Mike Sullivan are on, as is Ken Nolan and Kenneth St. Amour. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, uh, that's from fine. Repsa and um, Brooke Dingledean, um, our council is also on. Um, I assume that anybody else, yeah, it's showing. Time that's everybody. Just, so yep. that's everybody. Um, okay. Um, are there, um, so we have a quorum. Are there any um, modifications to the agenda? I have one, actually I have two. Um, Mike sent me an email that I forwarded to all of you uh, about potential dates for a ribbon cutting for H11. And um, I think we need to get back to folks fairly quickly. Um, so I would like to discuss that. Um, I sent that out this afternoon if you haven't seen it. Um, nope. And, and I think given how full our agenda is, I think if we do a preliminary budget review, it should be just very preliminary um, because- Yeah, we're, we're, we're not doing a presentation at all. We just gave that to you as a, here's what we're gonna work on and fine tune for you next month. Super, right. super. Okay. Um, all right, uh, any other modifications to the agenda? Hearing none, um, the agenda is approved. Okay, uh, which I think then takes us to the presentation on uh, AMI. Um, oh, sorry, approval of meeting minutes. Yeah, minute. yeah, sorry about that. Uh, my eye drifted too far down. Um, did anyone have any comments on the November minutes? Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Hearing none, the minutes from November are approved. And then we also have minutes from the December meeting. Um, is there a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Mike. Mike moved. Uh, Roger seconding. Okay. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Uh, the minutes are approved from December. Okay. Now it's time for the AMI presentation from Vepsa. Okay, and um, I am going to start that discussion. What I'd like to do is put up a, share my screen for a moment, <laughs> if I can. Uh, host disabled screen sharing. Can we? Can, can I can I ask a question? Is this, are you gonna be going through what we were sent? Because if, what, if it's what we yeah. were sent, I would prefer not to have screen sharing okay. and prefer to just use, um, <laughs> what what we have and then we can see each other and interact if we rather than staring at a dead screen as it were. Okay. That is fine. Oh. So um, I'll get started then as I said. What I would like to do is um, just start with a overview of what we've done over the last three plus years now, um, as well as take a look at the technical architecture, then turn it over to Ken, Ken Nolan, who will um, talk about more of the business type of issues with it. So with that, I'll get started. As I said, it's kind of been a three plus year effort and I'm looking at the AMI study timeline at this point. I think it's 
probably slide three in the deck. And started way back at the end of 2018. And essentially, we um, recruited uh, Lemmerhurt Consulting. We had gone out for an RFP uh, process on that to look at um, consultants that could help us look at what the AMI landscape is, who the vendors are, et cetera. So uh, we finalized on Lemmerhurt Consulting, uh, Jackie Lemmerhurt, primarily out of um, uh, Massachusetts. And she worked with a number of uh, folks in the early going to uh, look at all aspects of AMI. So part of that effort was beginning in 2019 with readiness assessments. Uh, she visited each of the members and looked at um, such things as, you know, landscape type of um, terrain that we would have to negotiate with an AMI network. Uh, she looked at um, current CIS vendors, how the billing is currently being done, <laughs> what the percentage of meters were from analog versus any digital meters that were out there, those types of things. And from that came up with a, a look at what would have to be done, what types of changes would have to be made, recommendations, et cetera, uh, to implement AMI. Um, from there, we did attend Distribute Tech, where we talked to a number of different vendors. And from that list, we looked at 11 different vendors who we sent an RFI to, a request for information um, process. And from those 11, we heard from nine. So we evaluated nine different vendors in terms of what they can offer, um, what their strengths, what their weaknesses were, et cetera. Had a large group look at that made up of the, you know, VEPSA board members, essentially the village managers. Mike participated in that. We also had VEPSA staff, VEPSA manager involved in that process and various folks from uh, each of the members, you know, looking at meter technicians, uh, billing personnel, accounting personnel, et cetera. So from that large process, um, we narrowed the list down to three vendors who were Hometown Connection slash ITRON, Landis and Gear, and Aclara Technologies. Um, from there, we put out an RFP, okay, which is what was the second one? Um, uh, a Clara, uh, a Landis and Gear okay. was the second one, I believe I mentioned. The connection broke up. Um, so from there, we came up with an RFP, which was a more formal process than the RFI. We had numeric scoring, et cetera. And we looked at that throughout 2000 or uh, yeah, throughout 2020. From there, narrowed it down to uh, two vendors and had a second round of interviews, follow up questions, et cetera, reference checks, and came up with a final vendor sec selection towards the very end of 2020, uh, which was Aclara Technologies. And um, so from there, we rolled into 2021 looking to negotiate contracts and uh, firm up their proposal, um, have a couple more interviews with them to uh, finalize mm -hmm. that selection. And during that time period, we were also doing some cost benefit analyses and cash flow analyses uh, from Lemmerhurt Consulting. So Jackie prepared all those documents for us. And we also took a little bit deeper dive into the cyber, cybersecurity concerns, essentially in anticipation of regulatory filings that are gonna be a part of this process. So here we are at the beginning of 2020, uh, 2022, and legal review is being finalized. Um, and we're trying to uh, finish up the contract negotiations with that. 
and uh, looking forward to the regulatory filings, et cetera. So next slide, if you um, okay, well, take a look. Could, at could, could I just interrupt for a second? Sure. Uh, just, just to go a step back for the purpose of, of the impl implementation of a AMI. I mean, uh, I, I know there are a number of them, but you know, I mean, just, I don't know if anybody else wants a quick review, but you know, for time of use, implementation, time of use rates, uh, uh, the ability, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you can just give us like a, a quick, like a several line review of, of the, the, uh, uh, the reason for AMI, just for sure. Time. Sure, Ken, if you would like to jump in there for some of the business analyses and et cetera. Yeah, we'll do I that a little bit earlier. We, we can put up the, the business case that Jack Lemmerher put together at the end, but um, th there's several paths or reasons for doing AMI. So you've got the operational aspects. Um, so these meters allow you to read the meters without having to, to roll trucks. So you're saving, you're saving on uh, trucks and, and fuel and things of that nature. Um, your it's safety for your employees. So they're not having to go out in winter storms or deal with you know, dog bites, upset customers, that sort of thing uh, to read the meters. Um, you've also got, as you mentioned, the time of use rates. So you, you're able to get 15 minute readings from each customer, which really allows you to design rates to match your costs in a much more granular level. So you can have different rates during the day and the night, different times, different months, uh, summer versus winter, that sort of thing. Um, you also have, have an ability um, to do rates around certain electrification appliances, electric vehicles, or you know, talking about heat pumps now are coming up for conversation. Um, can help you with outage management. So, and, and really optimizing your system. So the meters not only bring back kilowatt hour readings every 15 minutes, they also can provide you voltage every 15 minutes on every customer. So you can get voltage profiles on the whole system. If there is an outage, the meter will send a, what they call a last gas. So it'll let you know that uh, the power is out of particular customers, um, which some utilities use that as kind of a a simple outage management system. If you have a more complex one already, then you can feed that data into the outage management system um, to give you a better insight as to which customers or which device might, might be out. Um, it also gives you a notice from when the power comes back on. So you're not having to guess whether customers are on or have one or two that maybe didn't get picked up when you fixed a, a large outage. You can, you can track whether all your customers are on or not. Um, can deal with analytics, so uh, transformer loadings, um, line loadings, loss calculations, all of that's, you're able to calculate off the information you're getting back. So it gives you a lot more insight into the operation of your system, in addition to the operational savings and being able to use your employees for other more high value things. Um, and then lastly, I, I just, I have to say as I say at every commission or trustees meeting, um, we're getting, we're seeing more and more pressure from the legislature and the regulators to put this technology in. Um, most of the utilities in Vermont, all the utilities except for the VEPSA members, put this, these meters in in between 2009 and 2012. So there's a growing assumption amongst the state folks at Overview Utilities um, that this is a required technology. Um, and every, every t legislative session that comes up, well, you don't have it yet. Why don't you have it? When are you going to get it? Um, and there, we're now starting to see bills being passed that don't require the meters, but they're starting to require rate structures that you really can't do unless you have the meters. Um, electric vehicle rates is a good example. It passed in the transportation bill last year uh, that says by 2024, all the Vermont utilities have to have either a direct electric vehicle rate that's time of use based or offer time of use rates that are whole home. So the entire customer charges time of use rate um, that's really based around making it 
more inexpensive <laughs> to to run electric vehicles. Um, so I think the the pressure side is going to keep ramping up, um, and the the efficiencies are there at this point. And we'll, we'll show you in the business case. I mean, there is a payback to this. It's not for Hardwick. It's not as good as others who have like a water and, and uh, wastewater on the same metering system. You, you're going to take a little longer to get your money back, but it is a positive cash flow. That was one of the questions I had, Ken, when I was looking at this, and I wondered if the choices would have been the same if you weren't trying to optimize also for customers who have water systems um, and not just all electric systems. Um, and and that's that's a question. You know, are, are we are we winding up with something that's less optimal for us because this was something that was being done to bring in um, water systems as well? Was that even looked at? It, it was. I think um, going in, I was assuming what you described would be true. But I think with the Clara, uh, well, when we looked at Landis and Gear and we looked at Hometown Connections, which uses Itron as a, as a product, um, we actually found a Clara was higher, higher graded both for electric and water. I mean, that's one thing Ken's kind of skipped over in our analysis. We, we had every person on the review committee grade, in, grade the, the vendors independently. And we graded them based on their electric setup, their water setup, and their analytics. And a Clara won in every category with every person who scored them which I was shocked that it came out that way. But um, you know, some were fairly close, so I, some had a wider margin, I, but they- I think that uh, at least some of the origin of Lynn's question <clears throat> circles back to my efforts with vision. Mm -hmm. And since they only, I was telling you, I was telling my board some time ago that <clears throat> they had, before we did the pilot project, that vision had originally been eliminated because they didn't have water meters which they do now, but um, if that didn't change the package for us, Lynn, from a Clara. We're not paying more because- okay. that, um, That's really what my question was. It had nothing yeah, to do with- we, the... Our cost isn't driven up because um, a Clara does water, no. Clara is a major player. I mean, I know, I know yes. that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, 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 this is not, uh, but I just, I uh, when I saw that water was in the mix, it was just something yeah. that I wondered about. And I, I've, I've actually installed in a Clara system and worked with their equipment and their, their support staff. And I was waving the Clara flag pretty much all the way through this whole thing. And uh, that's where we landed, so. Yeah. The, the, the one thing on a, on a Clara that is, I think is head and shoulders above the rest. And I, even with the vision, you know, the pilots that we've done looking at vision and Mike's spent a lot of time on that. Um, in order to do a lot of the rate work and the analysis and load forecasting and things of that nature, you really need a meter data management system. And Eclair is the only vendor, meter data management system is like a huge database that stores all this information so you can query against it and ran, run analysis. Eclair is the only vendor that offered us a centralized meter data management system. So every, every member of VEPSA will have its own ability to, to track its customers. But the way Eclair is setting it up, VEPSA will be able to do analysis across all of the members together. So when we're looking at analytics or rate designs or things of that nature, rate cases, um, we can have access to all of the customer information to do like residential load shapes, commercial load shapes and things like that. Um, all of the other vendors wanted a separate meter data management system, one per utility, and to charge us the same license fee for all 11 of those, where with Eclara we're paying one license for one meter data management system even though everyone operates it independently and it looks like it's your own individual setup. That was a huge, huge uh, cost Big savings, savings versus yeah. the other, other vendors we saw. 
That's a cost savings for BEPSA. Is it also a cost savings for the individual utilities? It's, it's passed right through. So that's it's built in, built into the what Ken will be showing you for the cost is that's built into that that the fees we would have to charge is whatever Eclair is charging us, you pay the same. And um, what is the rate payer, the customer, the individual rate payer customer um, see? What access do they have to their data, if any? Yeah, the, the initial setup here is what they call meter to cash. So it's visible to your customer service staff and your billing staff. The initial deployment will not give the customer any um, access like a customer portal or anything like that. There, that is something we're looking for the second part of this. So initially we just wanna get the technology converted over so that we can do the rate designs and things like that in the, in the operational analytics. Phase two, we'll be looking at how do we get that information in the customer's hands in the most effective way. And that second phase two, that phase two will be additional cost, additional benefits for us to consider. Uh, it's not in the scope of what we're seeing here. That's correct. Okay. And where are the other utilities that are out ahead of us, understandably, because they're typically larger? What are they, what are their ratepayers, their customers seeing? I'm uh, my impression is in sophisticated parts of the country, I don't know if that's here in Vermont or not, that people have pretty remarkable visibility. You know, if they have solar, they see their, they see what they're generating, which everybody can do now, but then they also see what they're, what they're paying for off the grid and, you know, they can get to what, what time of day, I suppose, if you've got appliance isolated, they can see they, they can see that, what they're saving, how they could save. So where, what's the state of the world? And, and will we be just, to, will we be 10 years late getting there or five years late or what's your vision of what's possible? No, I, I well, this is the case where I think you can, you can leapfrog some of what other people are doing, but it's mm -hmm. in all honesty, I think the ability to give information to your customers is in large part driven by who your billing vendor is and your customer information system. Um, I think Hardwick's in good shape. You have you use SEDC, which is a pretty robust system. It's, it's pretty good at uh, talking to other software packages. There are gonna be some of the BEPSA members that use um, you know, homegrown billing systems or a company called NEMREC, which is really more for governmental entities they're gonna have a hard time sharing information with their customers. And part of the challenge we have is trying to come up with a, a vendor that can work across that spectrum. Um, there, are, there are a few out there that we're talking to already. I, I would see, you know, within a couple of years of, of having this system up and running, we'd be able to be in that place of showing customers their data and, and having access. Um, so our, it, uh, sorry, Ken, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it, it really varies from utility to utility. Um, you know, GMP, they use Oracle for their billing system, very expensive, very robust. You know, I'm one of their customers, I can see everything. To be honest though, I looked at it for two months and then stopped, <laughs> stopped looking. Um, I, I think where it becomes useful to a customer is if they're on a time of use rate. Yeah. It's important for them to know how much they're using at what times of day because you get no benefit from load shifting if people don't know what their load right. is. Um, and, and I think that's, that's when it becomes particularly important. It's important there and in some parts of the country, um, customers have retail choice or they may actually be purchasing from the grid. And so knowing what pricing is at, at various times becomes important, but that's, that's not the case here. So I, I, but, it, but I think as we move to time of day pricing, um, I think that's, that's when it becomes um, more of interest. Yeah. What is, uh, what is so, Joe using? I'm curious because they are more comparable to us. What is what now? Stowe. Uh, Stowe has radio frequency Elster system, I believe. 
That's so correct, Honeywell yes. Elster. So uh, SEDC is actually our, our CIS and accounting system, our Beth Esri expert in, uh, <laughs> as an alliance, alliance partnership with Aclara. So That's the it. integration for us to get in, in communications with Aclara has been done multiple times. Beth, I, I don't know if you want to speak to that or if you can talk to any of these other uh, additions later coming maybe easier or I don't know that sure uh, I, I can tell you uh, based on my experience with other SEDC customers and also at SEDC of all the SEDC customers that have, have AMI Aclara is the top user uh, Landis and Gear a second but they our program is really like Aclara because they're easy to work with so usually the only programming they have to do is when Aclara comes out with something new so they keep up with it. And uh, I do know that it's a very um, easy integration that already exists. Um, I believe, uh, Rod, was it you, Roger, that asked about customers seeing their usage? Yeah. I do, I do know that there are SEDC customers that have the uh, smart app that SEDC offers. And on that smart app, the customers can access their MDM data through that. So it shouldn't, be, but again, shouldn't it, be a big deal. It shouldn't be, but again, I'll go back to what Ken said. Um, a lot of times customers, they'll look at it for a couple of times and they're like, oh yeah, that's pretty. But then also you, you to consider, most customers won't wanna see 15 minute interval information. It's, it'll be too much of an overload. So, uh, so again, there's options in there to consider. So this, the spirit of my question um, was really around, it was building off of, I think where Vince was going on this is just strategically, we've all been well prepped by Mike and we, we know we've been e we're eager to see AMI get implemented and come into our world. We do have a sense that we're late. And I was just testing whether there's any possibility of us doing a little leapfrog where we could at least catch up, if not perhaps offer our customers and ratepayers something even better as we as we make up for lost time. And I don't know if we can really afford that at our scale. And I don't know if we have the bandwidth to execute it. I just figured at a commissioner level, it's a good question to ask. That, that was actually, that's a great yeah. lead into, I had a couple, well, specific and technical questions. Um, one is that, you know, the, the AMI data you're reading, at least the, the, the data that the, the user can get and the data the utility can get is what the direction of flow at the meter and, and the, the power or the current. And that's all they're gonna get. And they're not gonna get device level stuff you know, behind the meter uh, for one thing. Uh, uh, but the other uh, question was planning ahead, how and if so, uh, how do you see this as, as a component of uh, like OMS and DMS integration, you know, for more actual smart grid um, transition. I mean, th this is, you know, this is really important and especially for time of use rates and stuff, but it's, it's still, it doesn't pr provide de device level control. It doesn't provide integration of uh, DERs and doesn't provide integration of renewables. It's just a, you know, it provides an ability to read data. So how do you see this as uh, a step towards that? Yeah, so, so we're starting, this is the first stage in a technology roadmap we're trying to put in place. So um, parallel paths right now, we're working on the AMI, um, this meter to cache and getting the data. And it, it is more coming back than just the, the usage information. Uh, you have the alerts, like I said, you have voltage. So there is some ability to use this information to be, to make the distribution system more efficient. It's definitely- not real time though. It's not real time. Um, or is it? It yeah. can be, there's, there's add on functions you have to add to it. But for example, um, conservation voltage control, there are companies that use this voltage readings off the meters to be able to in real time, change tap changers and change the voltage okay. on the system to save power. So once you get this in place, there are other things you can do. Um, but we're 
So AMI um, one, is one component we're, we're trying to get in place. We see that as kind of a, as a basic first step uh, to start to make the transition. Simultaneously, we're working with Mike on, on geographic information system to try to gather as much data as we can on, on what your system looks like. Um, we have a, a software we've purchased from a company called Empower, which is, allows us to connect the GIS maps, so the map of your distribution system, with the AMI information. So then we can link up your transformers for, for loading studies. We can right. be able to do the engineering components. With those two in place, then we're looking to go to the next step, which would be looking at um, an outage management system, looking at the customer portal so uh, customers can start to see directly what's going on. Um, and we're working right now jointly with the other utilities in the state on the distributed energy resource um, management. It's, to be perfectly blunt about it, um, you know, GMP does a lot of press releases and saying this stuff works great. We have yet to find a software package that controls customer level devices in an economic way. Um, just that they don't exist. You can, you can contract with vendors that do control devices, but the pricing scheme they have in place basically takes all of the savings that the utility and customer would get and transfers it to the software company's pocket. Um, so no GE, for example, for their, their ADMS is not affordable. I mean, I, I this is looking at that. I, I was trying to see how that would apply to a, you know, a utility with 4,500 customers. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't. We, there's a company we're working with called virtual power. Um, you know, they, they conceivably can do electric vehicles and heat pumps and heat pump water heaters, but they charge you for that. Every device you connect into their software has another fee attached to it. And the fees are structured so that whatever you're saving on the power supply side, you're having to pay them. Um, so we're, we're actively working right now with Velco and the other distribution utilities to see if we can come up with a package that uses open source protocols to allow us then to, to work with any vendor and control it and where we have the software. Um, Velco got a grant from Pacific National Labs to actually look at how we would set that up. So that's kind of down the road, but we right now we wanna make sure we get the base technology in place so that when we have access to that software and, and the ability to control devices, we we're in a position to do it and we can see the data and make sure we're managing it properly. So like finding places on the distribution and where uh, you could defer distribution upgrades with storage at one at a location, for example. I, yeah, I we, will, go ahead. I will note that back in the dark ages and I'm talking about in the uh, 1980s um, at Commonwealth Edison, we did do a project. It was radio controlled and we had an interconnect on air conditioners and water heaters and we collected the data and it, it, the, the thing worked. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, this was, we did not have the sophistication of software that, that we have now. And so I would think that it, it has to be doable. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's crazy to be spending a, a ridiculous amount of money to, to, to get that information because it's. The, the, the complexity <laughs> now is just, I, I don't know if, if Mike shared with you this uh, FERC order 2222 and Lynn, I'm, you probably have run across this in your, in your day job, but. 100 kilowatt aggregators. Yeah. And um, being, I'm, so, being, I'm sorry, I, 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 I have, I, my work is international, so I haven't been doing FERC stuff ah, for a few okay. years, but um, what, what, what is the order? So FERC order 2222 requires all of the market, um, market entities. So for us, it would be ISO New England, mm -hmm. um, have to allow 100 kW aggregations to participate in the wholesale markets. Oh, geez. So they're at, <laughs> ISO New England will be filing in three weeks their rules that allow literally 
like a Sun Common who's putting in heat pumps and electric vehicle chargers around the state, conceivably they could aggregate up all of their retail customers and bid those devices into the wholesale markets. And then we have to be in a position to coordinate with them on whether the, the device is a wholesale device or a retail device or that's the that, level of complexity we're headed towards. And that's a final rule. It's being implemented now, yeah. Well, they, they haven't decided whether or not it's you know within a, a specific node or region-wide. And it's also, as it says, the implementation is as reasonable or, you know, I mean, there's no specific date. Yeah. It, to be clear, I mean, the, there is an opt-in provision for small utilities. So any utility that sells less than 4 million kilowatt hours, which would pretty much be everybody in Vermont, GMP is like right on the cusp of being able to decide. What, um, you have to opt into allowing this to occur. The concern I have is the opt-in is given to the quote regulatory authority for the utility. Oh Lord. Which in most cases for a <laughs> municipality is the commission or the city council. In Vermont, that's the public utility commission. It's so tyranny. If they yeah. um, it's um, Riley oh, Allen and, oh. and, and those folks at the PUC. So we're going to have a replay of the whole net metering thing because that's exactly who's going to do it, and they succeeded there, and look what we've got. Yes, but, you know, I mean, the idea of, of implementing this is to actually capture value for these resources and create markets that you know a lot with the ultimate goal of uh, of, of smoothing that demand curve, and you know, I mean, is there, I think they're. That's it's, that's naive. That's not. This is this is. Well, no, it, it, I think uh, you know. I think the obstacles are, are much more technical, and and it's just going to be a painful transition. Uh, I, I mean, I. Getting so, Canon. What I was going to ask you was, you Ken implemented the AMI system at Burlington Electric. How many years ago, Ken? What? Yeah, over ten. Yeah, yeah and where. Where has that expanded to in those 10 years? How many bells and whistles, you know, big ones have been added? Uh, in Burlington, they're actually retrenching right now. Um, the, the problem, <laughs> to say it nicely, I think the Vepson members were smart to wait because what the folks who went early have run into is you couldn't get these systems in a cloud-based environment. You had to put the servers and the hardware on premise. And now all those systems are coming up for refresh and Burlington's looking at spending another four to $6 million to replace what they put in 10 years ago. Um, they did a customer portal, which now they're rethinking because as I said, I mean, it was really popular when they did it, but six months in, cu customers weren't using it. Um, so they're evaluating whether they're better off just to beef up the this customer service representative capabilities and not really focus on the outside. Um, oh, sorry. As I say, the, 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 where they really focused is on the customer devices, but even there, they've gotten bitten. They, they spent a lot of time. Um, uh, working on with a, a Burlington-based startup at a UVM that just got sold. And basically the company that bought them is walking away from all of their pilots. So now Burlington's <laughs> got a bunch of devices out there that's trying to figure out what to do with. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't feel like the folks who went early are any better off. We look at Green Mountain Power with Elster. I mean, they, they had huge problems with Elster getting the meters up and running. I don't I think even today it's working exactly the way they envisioned it. Um, uh, it, it. It reminds me, at least, that it, it could be a real opportunity, you know, like uh, um, uh, lower income countries going right from no phones to cell phones and just, you know, jumping right over the uh, right over the landlines. I, I think a 10 year run for Burlington is pretty good given that technology changes so quickly now and 
if this was anything more than a five-year payback, it wouldn't even be a good idea because I think in five years, it's going to change again anyway. You have to, I think we have to be cognizant of things that are continually going to get better. Um, but I, one quick question, given especially the attitude of people nowadays and especially some of the emails we've received, what happens to customers who refuse the AMI because they say it's an invasion of privacy? I'll buy your electricity, but I want you to know how I use it, what I do with it. How do we deal with those particular customers, which I hope are very few? Yeah, my, my experience is that's about looking at what the other utilities have seen. It's 2% or less of customers opt out, as they call it. Um, Vermont still has a law on the books. The legislature passed saying if a customer doesn't want an AMI meter, you have to give let them stay with their existing meter. Um, they, each customer has a chance to do that if they choose. The opposite side is you can charge them whatever the cost is for the meter. fact that they're staying with the old technology. So if you still have to run a truck out to read one meter, that customer basically pays for it. Okay. A little financial incentive. Yeah, when, <clears throat> when uh, <clears throat> excuse me, CVPS first did the AMI project there, we had a pile of people opt out in the beginning but they dwindled out and uh, I think it landed somewhere between one and two percent. What and about? Ken, go, ahead. go ahead. No, 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 no. I, th I thought you had stopped. Yeah, the oh, only God. other thing I was going to share was when the uh, Elster system was being put online at CV, uh, the, the sales pitch and the Elster team there had said, oh, you, got, you guys are only going to need uh, 100 you know, of these remote uh, terminal units basically to read all your meters at, I think they were $20,000 a piece and they ended up needing over 400 of them. Oh. Yeah. What one, we seem to have cut Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, one, one question that, that, that I had was, related to what Michael just was, was asking, we have parts of our service territory where communications are, shall we say, difficult um, to non, you know, there is no cell service, there is no DSL, there is no uh, fiber, you know, um, how do we implement this or do we just not implement it with those customers? They're radio. Well, we do, and we're gonna have multiple, they don't call them gateways. What do they call them, Ken? Uh, they're the DSUs, um, DSU. or DCU, DCUs, I'm sorry, data collection units. Um, and I have done a, a quick survey of your service territory being more difficult than most. Um, you do have a very good perception of that. Uh, the Northern area, I really don't have a lot of concerns about. In Hardwick area, um, most of the Wolcott area, uh, Woodbury, there will be some, some alternate things that we'll have to do depending on how fast the CUDs move to get broadband out into those areas. Um, so that whole Southern area um, is a concern that we're, that we're looking at other technologies for beyond your cell phone and uh, your DSL uh, coverage. So um, Clara, that, is a, a that Clara, is a legitimate concern. Clara did do a propagation study, uh, Lynn, on the whole system, um, showing the, the areas that were gonna be trouble, not trouble, et cetera. So for example, uh, in, the, in the plan, we actually share a couple of the DCUs Two of them, I think, with Morrisville, right, Ken? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, to cover east west. But yeah, the southern area does have some dead holes in it that we're going to have to fix. So, how, do, how does the, the 500 megahertz, how does that perform? I mean, it's, I mean, we're talking about really low data rates, correct? I mean, you know, in the uh, sub kilobyte. We're going to be getting something like 100,000 readings every 15 minutes. Right, but from the individual units, 
I mean, they're really low data rates. Yes, relatively speaking, what we need is not a lot of bandwidth um, from the DCU back to the head end. So um, DSL, where it's available, will do it. Right. Um, that wouldn't be our first choice simply because of the reliability that, um, that they provide with that. Um, but that will certainly provide enough bandwidth. You don't need a lot. You don't need uh, fiber to each of these locations. Um, in reliability, Kenneth, there may be DSL on paper, but consolidated and reliability is almost an oxymoron. Yes. Um, um, Starlink, so, if it ever happens. I'm sorry? Starlink, if it ever happens, you know, is a possibility. Yeah. <clears throat> Dream on. I have no internet today. Yeah. And it was DSL. Just, I, I know we're bouncing all over the place, but I. Yeah, so it. one of the one of the big um, uh, hole fillers there, I guess, is there's uh, collector meters that can actually read other meters so you can strategically place those. Uh, oh, that guy, you know, 500 yards down in the hole there, I'll read him for you and I can reach the antenna and get the information back. So there's other ways to close the gap. And the, the, one of the advantages of the low data rate, I mean, the low data volume is error correction is relatively easy and, and recognizable if the signal is corrupted or, or the data is incomplete, for example. Anyway, I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, the, I, uh, just a Encryption question, are, is there a single key or it's, it's a key for every device? A uh, key for every device. Okay. Um, and and it's, that's done within manufacturing mm -hmm. um, for each end device, in your case, electric meters only, um, all the way up to the, through the uh, DCU uh, to the head end. So there is that public key interchange that is going on um, and it's AES-256, so it's the latest encryption technology um, for this. So Clara being, you know, a large provider has really tried to keep up with the um, encryption and authentication technology. Um, and that's one of, their, one of their differentials, I believe, going forward. So before we go off on our 21st tangent, can we circle back to Ken and let him continue? Yes. <laughs> well, I think, I think if, I mean, you have all of that information in front of you. So if you don't want to hear it, that's perfectely good with me because, you I'd know, like these you to go, topics. I'd like you to go through it all. Okay. I don't want anything missed here. All right. So um, what we're looking I mean, at it's here. It's the board. That said, it's the board's meeting. If they don't want to hear it, it's up to them. I have well, as long as we're still going back to the that that timeline, and and the contract, I'm I'm guessing here that uh, this will be like other things where they're back to back contracts with the utilities. Um, I would like to see that contract before it gets so far along that we don't have an opportunity to comment on it, uh, because we're going to be stuck with it unless we decide not to go forward with this, this project. Um, because that's not a, that's, I understand everything that Ken said about, you know, the state and we're behind and, and I think we should be doing AMI. Um, I have questions about this particular project. I, one of them relates to, to what Michael said about payback. I think, you know, an eight plus year payback is awfully long. Um, especially when the benefits are, I would argue, less certain than the costs. And some of the costs, we also don't know, like, are we going to need more DCUs and that kind of thing? And presumably, we're the ones who are going to have to pay for that. That Eclair is not going to say, this is what we'll do. Uh, well, let me, let me ask, is Eclair saying, we're going to do whatever needs to be done on your system for this, for a flat <laughs> fee? Uh, I, I'm taking a wild guess that that's not the case. Not as clear cut as that, but uh, yeah, I remember I remember our previous conversations on contracts one. So yes, we're um, we have right now the contract between Vepsa and Eclara has just finished our legal review. Bill Ellis has looked at it for us. Um, 
and we're, we have a draft of an agreement between VEPSA and each of the members. So that will be coming around shortly. I'm just trying to make sure everything's all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted on our side before we share it around. So you will definitely see that before we're locked in and have an opportunity to comment on, on changes you might want to see. And re related to what, what you asked, Lynn, I mean, really importantly, how proprietary is the system? Are there standard like database migration protocols that we can use to go to another vendor? Uh, are the licenses on the DCUs uh, transferable? You know, what, can they integrate with another vendor at some time? I mean, you know, just having that sort of transportability is. You're, you're not gonna get that with any, anybody no. today. I mean, that's one of the things we're continuing to push on is the interoperability and transferability. But it doesn't, if you bought Lannis and Gear, Itron, Eclara, Elster, they all are proprietary at this point. Um, it's just, no, it's just no, the way the, no hacks <laughs> available. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the, the, just the way the industry has developed up until now. Hmm. That um, seems like an area of uh, FERC should concentrate on, make, or, or, you know, with IEEE. Yeah. I mean, there, there is, if you go back to 2010, there, were, there was no standardization, no IEEE protocols or anything. Um, that's come a long ways, but it's still, everybody has their wrapper around it still. Um, so some of the base technologies are standardized, but you can't transfer it between vendors. It's just the way it is. Um, so, and reminds, reminds another question, the records are available for 25 months. Uh, the data is available for 25 months and they have backups and that, you know, but uh, then that led to a question, uh, which later on seemed to be addressed, it said there can be local backups also. Now, are these local backups available? Is it data that can be used? The local backup? I mean, are you able to you know, pull out the data for uh, use outside of their ecosystem? Where, where did it say the data was available only for 25 months? I missed that. As, oh, there it is. I see it. I never mind. I just spotted it. It's the MDM will have it for 25 months. That doesn't preclude us from doing a data warehouse of longer term if we choose to do that. For each field. Every... Yeah, you can pick and choose what you want to keep at that point. But all I can speak to the backup question. I know he's belt suspenders, <laughs> overalls. <laughs> yeah, the, um, effectively what they're, what they're selling us is a Microsoft Azure based cloud presence so they they being a clara has taken care of all of the dr functionality built into that per meter per month charge of three dollars and 96 cents um, that's all inclusive of the disaster recovery scenarios turning it to your question um what type of access would we have for the data Again, that's what Ken alluded to is we would have the ability to download any amount of data that we had capacity um, to store. So in a useful the, manner, I mean, for, yeah, we addressed and well, that's all that would all be up to us in terms of how we want to structure the data. But I know that for various studies and so on that we are planning on bringing subsets of that data down um, for various analyses, be it voltage analysis, um, you know, integrating with Empower as Ken, met, Ken mentioned earlier. So the data isn't so much a concern, it's just if you decide to go to another vendor, uh, they all seem to make their revenue on selling their meters. So you know, going to a different vendor might mean replacing a large quantity of meters, if not all meters, and so on and so forth. So that's more of the, the, the limitation in the business model that each of these vendors has built up. Um, so, but the data is the data, and we would be able to maintain access of that uh, moving forward if we uh, chose to go in a different direction. Is, is there any indication? Uh, that uh, they're going to be 
standardized protocols for either either devices or um, communication or you know that in the near future uh, that are going to be outside of these proprietary ecosystems. I haven't heard anything like that. Um, the only, I mean, it would be pure speculation on my right. part to see if somebody really is going to drive that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Really, yeah. Ask questions. <laughs> the, the only, yeah. um, I would answer a little bit differently in that the one thing on the device side that Eclara did, did offer that others didn't um, is that they're working with other meter vendors to try to allow you to buy multiple meters. So you can buy um, a uh, Landis and Gear meter with an Eclara card in it and talk to their system. Um, okay. So they're, they're trying to give you options on the meter device itself, but they still are gonna wrap in their proprietary communications piece. Uh, and uh, so they're providing the devices, the hardware and the SAAS. And for example, going back to Stowe, they're getting the, their- Just, can, you, can we move away from jargon? I don't know what an SAA. is. Okay, sorry. Software as a system, they're, they're doing the, the background. Um, right, so that's going to be a long meeting. Presentation. Let's get back to Ken Santamore. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, where I was headed was essentially just doing an overview of the system, which we've kind of got into a lot of the details on. The DCUs are the core of the system. They've spec'd out 42 for Hardwick service territory. So, you know, as you know, you're spread out from north to south over how many miles, Mike? It's, it's a long way. It's largest of anybody else, even Lindenville, uh, from north to south. And so 42 DCUs from the meter to the DCU is a 400 megahertz, uh, 450 to 470 to be exact about it, uh, point to point communication. So each essentially a star topology so that each meter is talking directly to the DCU. So there's no hopping going on here. Uh, the 450 to 470 range is FCC licensed. So we do have some protection there if from interference as opposed to the 200 megahertz systems that are more of your mess base jumping from meter to meter. Looking across from left to right here from the DCU, we all, we've already touched upon the fact that we, all, we need some back haul media to um, bring this back to the Azure environment where we have the network management, essentially three components that you see stacked here. The network management, the data collection, that's essentially what the core uh, AMI, you know, that advanced metering infrastructure is, is looking at. And then the, they roll in their meter data management, which gets to the data storage that Ken talked about um, a few moments ago. So it's all in the Microsoft Azure um, implementation. It's in their data centers. We feel like that's an advantage because it allows us to offload all of that disaster recovery type scenarios and you know putting allowing them to put it on different virtual machines out there, essentially virtual servers so that they can move it around as they see fit and what their needs are. For us to create an environment like that on our scale just, just can't happen. Um, you know, we virtualize servers, but it's one or two, three, or two or three different servers in a platform, not to the scale that they do it. So it's what they do every day and they're experts at it. So looking back, Referencing back to here, I think to talk a little bit more about the architecture, uh, the next slide just has a, another, mm -hmm. another overview of what we're looking at. So here the orange dots are, are um, the DCU locations spread out. You can see I'm looking at, I took a snapshot of your system that essentially is Hardwick in the lower left going up towards uh, 
going up Route 14 uh, in the middle there and going to the left into the, the part of the system that uh, goes into Woka. Um, so essentially the blue meters or the, the blue dots are your meters, your customary meters. Um, orange dots are the DCU locations that they're all concentrated to. And then we back haul each of those back to the Aclara One system, which is that three component stack that we saw on the prior slide. The next one is really busy. So I just want to touch upon a couple of different highlights, essentially where the folks are going to access the multi-tenant MDM. VEPS is going to access that across uh, multiple utilities. And then each utility has their access um, to their own uh, set of uh, customers and, and the associated meters with that. So and then on the top part of this diagram, again, is just the, the AMI infrastructure uh, for the DCUs over the backhaul to the Eclara One stack. I, I have a quick question, sorry. Kenneth. Um, uh -huh. so, so what access is VEPSA going to have to individual customer information, or will it? Or is it just going to be pooled data? And if it's individual, <coughs> sorry, my... <coughs> My plow person just came and my dog is protecting us from the plow. Um, as he sh um, yeah, so what, what level of customer information for individual? In other words, is VEPSA going to be able to identify individual customers and, and what are they going to, what information are they going to have about them? Yeah, we'll um, have access to the individual customer in terms of meter ID without more information from the SEDC CIS, uh, we wouldn't have any um, reason to look at that particular data. That would still be maintained primarily, at least initially as a Hardwick function. Um, once it gets to the Empower integration of mapping where we're looking at individual feeders, and individual customers, you could argue that there would be some insight into um, who the people are if we became familiar with uh, where your customers live, for instance. So essentially, we would be looking at 15-minute meter demands um, on a meter ID. And you're not the, their, their utility. You have no obligation to them. I have some real... Uh, we, I, I think we need to find a way to anonymize. So, so just for what it's worth, happy to have the conversation, but just for context, um, we did get a PUC ruling I think six months ago. Um, we are we are a contractor to the utilities. So any of our members, we are a contractor to, and we're obligated to operate within whatever privacy constraints you put on us. So it's not that you would necessarily be breaking customer privacy by allowing us to see the data, because we're an, ex as far as the Public Utility Commission's concerned, we're an extension of your staff. I, I understand. I understand that, and I, that's certainly that's the way I've always viewed VEPSA. Um, and and we can have whatever confidentiality agreements we need to have, or whatever else. That's not my concern. My concern is that part of the justification for our existence is that we're local, and and this is and this is all kept local, yeah. and VEPSA isn't. And, and most of our customers don't even know that VEPSA exists. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm not saying it's a bar to this, but it's a concern. Yep. Um, I, think, I think the balancing act here is in, in order to get, for example, the load forecasting, the rate design, we, we need to be able to aggregate up residential customers. We need to be able to aggregate up Transformer customers, things like that. So we yeah, finding the balancing aggregate point. Data. Aggregate data is not, it, I don't think is an issue. 
but it's 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 individual customer data um, that I think starts becoming more of a concern, and and we are so distributed, if you will, that it's not very hard. I mean, I could look at this map that Kenneth that you had of of our service territory, and. I can see where which which dot is me. Yep. Uh, 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 Clara may be able to just give administrative level of access. You know, so FEFSA doesn't have while well, it has the numbers, it doesn't have. Anyway, I, I just I I just was curious what you know what what that was. Can we go back to the blue dots for a second and the and the cost? Has anyone looked at? You lost your mic. He's frozen. Got it. Did you lose me? Now yeah, you're back. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll start from again. What you got? But did anyone look at? Since my interconnection is unstable, hopefully you can still hear me. Maybe if we took, there's 80% of our users would cost us 50% of the construction cost, and getting the, the other 20% of our users is costing us the other 50% of the construction cost. Is there a point where it doesn't make sense to pick everybody up? Is there a, a nucleus of users that we get the best bang for the buck instead of doing everybody? Doesn't the state require I, that? I, would, I don't know. That's I the would, question. Does the state require yeah, I would. I would venture a guess. The answer would be yes, but we can't offer only some of our customers certain rates and other customers right. only other rates. We have to go to everybody. Well, right. we could have different classes of customers if there's some basis for it. Um, but it, 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 I don't think we can, I don't know whether, I don't know if you've looked at whether, whether. I don't think, I mean, give it. You know, regional, you know, geographic distinctions. Given the way the system is designed with the DCUs and, and you really, you want to have two DCUs able to reach each meter. So if one fails, you have a backup path. Um, I, th I think it's unlikely for most of the system that you could drastically reduce your installation cost and avoid cost. The one area that I think is open for debate is, as Ken described, the Woodbury, where we may have to go to an alternate type back home. Um, and, and that may be an area where you could say, yes, if we don't install equipment there, we can save some money. But I think the rest of it is fairly modular the way this is set up and bid out. So that just on the, the uh, meter expense, which would be the huge, the biggest savings, I think, in, in that scenario, Mike. So to buy a decent time of use meter or, or a bi-directional meter, which is what we need right now. Uh, and that's all we install now, an electronic bi-directional meter. Uh, new is probably 35 or $40. And these meters for the AMI system are 120 a piece, Ken? Yes, right? 122. So, so 80 bucks times, uh, 4,500 customer, or whatever number of customers, it would say it was 2,500, call it 2,000 so I can do it easily. So you'd be saving 160,000 in that scenario. I think you'd waste, you'd go bald trying to trying to build the, the system to save that $168,000. I'm gonna go gray before I go bald. It would, well, <laughs> I'm on the other end of the spectrum. So, so speaking of speaking of meters, so uh, is there any? Would there be any use for the existing meters, or are they just a, a stranded asset, essentially? So there are vendors uh, that that will buy them, and then they take them and sell them to little utilities in South America and stuff. But they they really aren't worth anything. Yeah, and, and look like there's no inventory of of those type of meters right now. Look, looking at the uh, looking at the one of the reports, I mean, so so there's not going to be any. It, it, you know, if this gets implemented tomorrow, there are really very few meters that you have. None of our none of our meters are usable. 
Okay, right. Zero. But, but you don't have any in inventory right now outside no. of what's it? Okay. No. You order them as needed. <clears throat> you mean meters? Water. If I need a meter tomorrow? Right. We have probably 400 meters in stock. Okay. It said zero meters, uh, zero value or whatever on, on one of the sheets for a meter inventory. So that right. made me think there were no meters. There's zero AMI value. Okay. Back to you, Mr. Santamore. Okay. I guess the only other thing before we get to the costs that I would like to mention is cybersecurity. We've already talked about um, Eclair's implementation with the encryption, et cetera. Um, so the only other thing to add is, you know, that Hardwick is participating in the um, security, cybersecurity program, which essentially is three prongs. Um, we're, we contract with uh, uh, CrowdStrike, a national worldwide vendor, really, but concentrated in the U.S., um, as a software as a service provider where they're watching over our endpoints and doing the things that we don't have the security staff to do. So essentially, um, they're looking at each of the envoy, endpoints, each server, each desktop, each laptop um, to identify any type of analysis um, abnormalities that are then reported on and acted upon. So um, that's one leg of it. The other end is um, a product called Sixth Sense that we use to remotely uh, make sure all the patching is done. Um, you're familiar with the fact that Microsoft needs to constantly be patched as well as other applications. Um, so we have this piece of software that allows us to do that. Um, and then uh, we have, we participate in no before's programming for user training for anti phishing type of attacks so that we can remind folks and just reinforce the idea of what which, which emails you want to click on what you don't what the procedure should be with uh, receiving emails etc so biggest vulnerability pardon it's the biggest vu vulnerability yeah, it really is. It's the one that keeps me awake at night. Um, you know, the insurance companies are having us look and implement that a lot of a lot of other protocols. But still, as long as you have that end user there, we're all subject to the fact that we can be fooled. Mm -hmm. And um, it is what it is. So all we can do is um, work with these training programs and and try to try to make it the smallest window that we can. Um, so that brings us to cost. You've all got the cost sheet there. Um, you'll notice the Eclara cost summary of 898, 898,000 um, meter installation costs. That's either essentially- Before, Mike, can I so Yes. So this, this 900,000 for Clara, does that include the cost of the meters themselves? Oh, yes. That's the bulk of the okay, cost. So that's, yeah, so that, uh, my estimates, that's about $550,000 out of, out of that? And out the of? The, out of the 900, and the rest of it is, is, is software? Um, and yeah, I really... And the DCUs and, and, you know, the other equipment. Yeah, it's it's everything. It's services. It's the DCUs. It's the the meters, um, and essentially network services. So everything other than the ongoing per meter charge uh, that we'll look at at the next sheet. Um, but to put a fine point on that, the Eclara the the first year cost for Eclara includes standing up the software, installing the DCUs. The, the meter purchase include a Clara project managing this other than the little the component we have to make sure we're, we're meeting our our own obligations they're going to have a dedicated project manager so it's it's the full cost of implementing the technology in Hardwick that first year yes 
And this means we can put the meter anywhere we want, right, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> we we want to put it. We want as many of them to go right where they are as we can. No, be I, I'm things. just kidding. Uh, but it's not it's not really as dependent on you. You don't have somebody driving up needs clear access, you know, visibility. Right. So we have some meters that still are in people's basements. <laughs> so we won't we don't have to go we won't have to go in their basements anymore. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and then just reading across each of the columns, um, I think most of them are self-explanatory. The meter installation costs, we looked at a per meter install if somebody were to be contracted with to do those installation costs. So it's either looking at an estimate of a hard cost or a soft cost if hardware personnel does that. Uh, project contingency you still see is quite high. We still have a couple have a of question. things. Sorry, sorry, yeah. I have a question for Mike. Do we have the staff that could put in 4,500 meters in, in, in this time period? So and actually, their jobs? yeah, depending on uh, where we land in this uh, rollout schedule, if, if you all decided, yep, sign us up, give us the dotted line, we're, we're going to Clara. I would start buying those meters immediately and start rotating them in. Um, as you may or may not recall, I started buying uh, 400 meters a year just to get rid of our old plant before we started talking about AMI. And we've probably changed 3,000 of our meters over the last four, four and a half years to these electronic bi-directional ones. So if we're two years out, if we were to say, yep, we're gonna go, gonna go with Clara and I could buy and install meters over the next two years, then I think we could definitely have them in, done and ready to go when Ken was getting ready to pull the trigger for us. So, so we, would, we would definitely have some avoided costs there. Yeah. One of the, conversely, one of the benefits of the Eclara, the fact that each meter communicates directly to the DCU is, you're not dependent on other meters through the communication path. So if you decided to put the DCUs in first and then over a couple of years put the meters in, it would work just fine. It would work the way Mike described with the meters first and the DCUs after, or you could do the reverse and, and you wouldn't. Or if you went with like a, an ITRON mesh network, the meters are hopping to each other. You, you have to have a, a minimum number installed for the system to work. Uh, but Clara is not set up that way. Are these, hmm. are these set up? Do they have like a future uh, backup, communications backup, like a Wi Fi capability, you know, through whatever the, if the, the house has Wi Fi and the. Uh, no, they don't. No. Okay. It's only and under a Clara's radio frequency and under their protocol. And so the 4,500 meters at 150,000, that's the actual physically removing the old meter and putting the, I assume these are plug and play other than the setup, you know, the populating of the, their um, SAAS. Uh, well, we're going to have, we're going to have some of that $150,000. Um, a plug and play one, Vince, is called an S base, socket based meter. So you have a yeah. meter socket on the side of your house. We pull the meter out, we plug another one in, we're gone. A lot of people and a lot of our customers, like the ones in the basement, are going to have what's called an A-base meter. So those meters are actually hardwired into the customer's service entrance equipment. Yeah. Huh. So we could get into hundreds of dollars, you know, real quick and just removing that meter and putting in what we need. And this is, this is a cost because it's being, uh, because it's being proposed, because it's being implemented by Heart of Electric that, and they have a functioning meter that you can't really charge them for this new right. great meter. Right, but I, I have some tricks up pay. my sleeve. They have, yeah. Uh, yeah, they are going to pay. Exactly. Right? <laughs> but, uh, this is, yeah, this is a lot the of these. Way. A lot of these, uh, I'll call them the potential problem services. Uh, there is a device uh, 
I can't remember the vendor, but they make an A to S adapter. Okay. So you take the A meter out, wire this adapter right into the exact same spot, and it becomes a socket. So now you're plug and play again. So there's ways to there's ways around the hurdle. I'm just trying to uh, uh, reconcile the hundred fifty thousand dollars for what I thought we were plug and play meters. You know, yeah, going. We, we, I don't expect we'll have anywhere near that much money into that. Right. So, so okay. just just for consistency across all the VEPSA members, we basically said if, if you're hiring a vendor to come in, it's going to drop a right. bunch of crew, and in two weeks they change all the meters out. The typical price for that is thirty-five dollars per meter. Right. So that's what the hundred and fifty thousand reflects. Okay. Hey, Nat. Yeah. Quit breathing heavy. <laughs> I'm just nervous. Just thinking about getting that new meter. <laughs> I've got a new, I've got two meters out there. Uh. But I assume I only need one of these. You still no, need the you'll production still, meter, You'll right? still need two. You'll still need two. Yep. Let's let's keep moving. I mean, we we tried to do a two hour meeting and and we're at an hour and a half almost yeah. now. It's so interesting. So the uh, the next page is simply that metering charge that that Eclara will be collecting each year, uh, three dollars and ninety six cents roughly. Um, so anyway, metering charge throughout the. Uh, 15 year period or not metering charge, carrying charge, maintenance charge um, for 15 years. Um, so that's, it, and that's 396 per meter per month, I think is what you said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's what is proposed currently. So that's what I have um, for way of describing what the system would be. So I think we've I'm not, talked. I'm not trying to get us hurdled here, but that, that math doesn't add up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to take a look at exactly yeah. what's in there then, Mike. Yeah, because uh, I'm sure. If, if you can circle back and just give me some more data on that line that yeah. I can share with the board. That yeah, would be okay. okay. And, and 15 years is the life of the contract or is that the, the useful life of the devices? That's the guaranteed or, or life of the meters. But they, they should last longer. That's isn't that right, Ken? That's what they're saying. Well, they they won't last as long as the meters they're going to be replacing. Um, but you won't have wholesale failures there. But considering they are an electronic device versus an analog device, there there will be some failures uh, throughout that fifteen year period. But that is the expected life of the um, the meter. Yes. And they're usually non-repairable failures. Absolutely non-repairable. The uh, one of the one of the uh, positives of the Eclara meters is they purchased the uh, GE factory down in Summersworth, and they're Summersworth, New Hampshire, and they're making their own meters there now. And I've been to that facility, and GE was the Cadillac of meters back in the day. And we still have uh, EV meters, which were some of the first four channel recording, multi capability, basically computers on the side of your house. And those went in in like 1992 or three, and they're still chugging along, no problem. So I think 15 years is very conservative. Yeah, and just for full disclosure, Mike, um, all the engineering and all of that work is still done in Summersworth but the, they shifted to manufacturing about two years ago down to Mexico. Oh, no like kidding, I didn't know just that. Just like everybody okay. else has, yeah. So they shifted it somewhere. So yeah. just to, to, uh, for, to make sure that we've got the updated information from Eclara, because that question was asked oh, a couple months ago um, and all the engineering work and support work comes out of New Hampshire, but they did do the manufacturing, okay. the fab. The fabrication is is in Mexico now. So so you're going to check on um, 
these figures in years two through 15, because they absolutely do not mesh with. Yep. Um, he'll, he'll fill me in and I'll share it with everybody. I'd like to have some detail on what that fee actually pays for, Ken, personally, too. Yeah, one, one of the big things, we'll definitely get to the details, but one of the big things is that includes all the software updates. So like the folks who went back in 2010, if the software got improved, you know, you could be two versions behind and then you had to pay to do the upgrade and you potentially would have to pay another license if you got too far behind. Um, because this is cloud-based, Eclara is responsible for maintaining the software. If they come out with a new release, that's included in the package, and they do the installation, they do the maintenance, um, the server so, upgrades, all that stuff's on them, not us. So the the, the gateways and the DC the DCUs and the the meters, their the firmware updates are just right through the radio signal or through to the DCU and then to the meter. Correct. So you don't have to go out and do it. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Yeah, just just to wrap up on the financial side, because I know we're running running way over here, but um, this is the, the um, business executive summary that was in the package can sent over. Um, that's what Jackie Lemmerhertz put together, looking at the the cost and benefit side. Separate, separate report for each member. Some have a payback, you know, three to four years. Like I said, mostly if you've got a water system, the, the payback was a little bit quicker because um, you have costs you're avoiding on that side too. Um, for Hardwick, we're looking at benefits of about three and a half million dollars. So net cost, net benefit over the 15 years would be close to 2 million. Um, that analysis, Jackie, looked at all the different things that could be a benefit, um, talked to Mike and his team make, to see if they agreed with you know, the savings she was in, envisioning. So I think this is kind of a consensus view on the types of benefits you would see. Can um, we get, can we get that it the detail on that? Detail? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, that, you know, an executive summary is nice, but it's not the report. I would like to see the whole. Okay. Uh, so, just in a sense, can you tell us what the difference is between meter operations and field operations in terms of the benefits? What are those two things? What differentiates one from the other? What's a meter operation versus a field operation that's saving all this money? Yeah, so further up, lost it. Just before uh, I forget, Ken, the, uh, I have Jackie's full report, don't I? Pretty sure I do. So I'll get yes, that. you do. I'll, yes, get you that do. To my, I'll get that to the board. Thank you. Um, a little bit before the table in the executive oh, yeah, see summary, we've got the meter operations is all the items around actual reading the meters and the accuracy and things of that nature. Um, and then the field operations is further down and it's talking about the outage management and system alerts for vegetation, vegetation management and some of the analytics you can do on the broader system with the data. Yeah. Be nice to know what that, how that, how that came about. That number, yeah, for those items. There, there's I, a, there's a number for each item in the full report, so we can certainly get does, that to you. Does it explain how it was derived? Because these are not um, necessarily particularly straightforward things. And I, I mean, and I guess some of the question is, to the extent that there's a benefit that reduces the utilities costs that translates into a benefit for our customers in the long run because it means that we don't have to raise rates. Right. To the extent that there's benefits for particular customers, that benefits those customers but not our rate payers. I, I, again, one on the improved meter operations, you know, that you only need a single meter for net metering. Well, that's nice for the net metering customer, but it does nothing for um, the rest of our customers, most of whom are not net metering customers. Um, so it, it's those kinds of things. It would be, I hope the report distinguishes, you know, and is not putting individual customer benefits into system benefits. And, uh, there, and 
just adding to what you said, Lynn, the, I mean, there are the financial benefits and how they're der derived, but what, uh, what's the regulatory pressure to provide time of use rates? I mean, this is really the only way to provide time of use rates, correct? Yeah. Well, there are other kinds of time of use meters. I mean, you could do, you know, yeah. you know, this is, this is, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But you, yeah. it would, it would incur a lot more labor in reading the meters, for example. Uh, it depends on the meat. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what the latest technology is, but I can, I can tell you what the technology was 40 years ago. And 40 <laughs> years ago, you could plug in a thing that would read the meter and would give you right. all the data. Um, and, you know, it took and two you, seconds. And probably wire, wirelessly now, you know, you go within a certain range of the meter. And uh, but, I mean, do but, those exist? In, yeah. in any, I, I, I don't know, but the, uh, you can do time of use rates without. Okay. It's but the, qu qu the question is that the value of the regulatory compliance and the necessity of regulatory compliance, I guess. Well, uh, th there's a difference between value and necessity. Net metering is- Right, I, I know, that's why I distinguish them. <laughs> but, but, but it's a necessity. Um, so so we, what, one of the things Jackie tried to um, evaluate in the report is value for like power supply, if we could do demand response or what, what was the likely reduction in power costs due to time of use rates if we were aligning costs correctly. So there's, there's a regulatory component, there's a power supply value component. Um, I don't, I think this number, I'm going off memory here, Lynn, but I think this number does include a little bit for the net metering but the detailed report has each of those items broken out separately. So you can easily go in and if you feel one of the values is a customer specific, it's, it'll be easy enough to pull that out. Does um, it break out the discount rate and, and, and inflation assumptions and all of that as well? Okay. Yes. And not to get too much into the weeds, but the, the, the power supply can, the, the control, I mean, that's a pretty crude control. It's either shutting it off or turning it on, correct? at the meter. It's not a device, specific device control behind the meter. Uh, right. It was we already clarified that we're not controlling the right. right. Okay. Right. It was an assumption about how much, if you get a, a time of use rates aligned properly, how much of the load could you envision being shifted, whether that's through direct control or the customer moving their usage patterns. Right. And what is the value of that? Because you're, you're potentially saving capacity and transmission costs and the differential between the peak uh, energy right. cost and, and the off-peak energy cost. So there's components Ken, in there. Ken, for, for GMP, for Burlington Electric, uh, you know, who've had this for a while, I don't know, maybe some of the other, are they actually seeing benefits? Are they seeing cost savings on, on purchase power costs, on, on, uh, on anything? Yeah, I, I think I can speak more directly to Burlington and I would say, when I left, that was five years ago now, but when I left Burlington, mm. they were seeing minimal benefits on the power side. They were seeing more benefits than they expected on the operations side. Um, they actually were, were having visibility and fixing some problems on the system that they wouldn't have seen before. So customer satisfaction, operational savings were, were more than they thought power supply savings were less than they thought. Um, and that, to be honest, I harped on that when Jackie was putting these reports together. So I think they're a little more realistic. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say they're perfect, but um, we brought some of that previous experience in. Now, GMP will argue the exact opposite. They will tell you that, oh, this system has allowed them to do their battery storage and they're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. Um, but when I've asked them for the calculations behind those press releases, I have yet to receive them. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the, uh, capital investment driver. So, Ken and Ken, if if uh, Lynn and the team really want to get into the weeds on Jackie's data, would it be possible to have her join us? Maybe Absolutely. next meeting. So, I'll get that data to you all tomorrow. And if you can go through it in the next week to 10 days or try to and see if it's going to help or not, um, maybe we could line up Jackie for, for a follow-up.
What's the time frame for us to be making a decision about this? So last two points I want to make, and then I'll answer your question. Um, um, on the financing side, one thing to be aware of is we are actively pursuing state and federal money for this project. Um, we've made a pitch to the legislature, and I've actually got a meeting tomorrow on this topic. Um, we're arguing that since the state has gotten um, our money, the, the federal COVID relief funds, and they've withheld, I think, more than $100 million in that money, um, waiting to see what the climate action plan said, we're suggesting that the VEPSA member utilities should get the same 50% discount that all the other utilities got from their ARA funding. Um, and we're trying to get the state to earmark $6 million to, to this project to, to buy it down by 50%. So, that's so the, the, other, the other utilities that implemented AMI did it with some federal, got a 50% benefit from the federal government. That would be awesome. Yeah. So, no guarantees, but we're, we're pushing it hard. Um, and we also have, I just hired a grant a consultant to help us go through the infrastructure bill that got up, approved, uh, when was it, end of December, first part of January. Um, and we're actively looking in that bill whether there's grant opportunities to fund this project as well. So I think, you know, we got a couple of potential ways to buy the cost down. Um, and on the financing side, um, I'm not sure you guys are in this boat, but some members have asked us, well, could VEPSA borrow the money and turn the, instead of us coming up with $800,000 year one, could we turn that into like a, a monthly charge or an annual charge uh, to pay down a loan? So we're working with TD Bank right now to try to get a, a loan structure that would allow us to borrow money for three years as we're deploying meters and then pay a loan back over the, the 15 year life after that. And I don't, I don't have the specifics around what the interest rate would look like yet, but we're, we're working that. So that plays into what's the timeline for decision making. Um, today was kind of making sure everybody got all the information and trying to get all the members on the same page as far, far as knowledge base. Um, the next steps are I want to get the contract to the point that we're comfortable sharing it with the members so you all can see what that looks like. Um, have the, the loan terms so you can evaluate whether that makes sense or not for to use it. Um, and then the trick on the, the funding side, the state and federal funding is you want to be close enough to shovel ready that you can argue that if they just gave you the money, you'd go tomorrow, but you don't want to have actually made the decision because they, they don't have to give you any money once you make the decision. <laughs> um, so we're trying to get to that point. Um, I'm envisioning that we'll, we'll know within two to three months whether we're going to have state funding coming. Um, so we're looking probably in the March to April time frame, circling back with everybody and, and asking for go, no go, or do you need some more time to make a decision? Ideally, we want to move forward with three of the members this year if we can get to that point. Is that a threshold for getting a certain price? Ken, you have the specifics. There is a minimum number of meters we need to have before Clara has an opener to raise the price, but I think. Yes. Can you remind um, me what that number is? Yeah, it's 10,000 meters. So a third, roughly a third of the meters would have to participate. Well, to half of that. Some of the members have water meters as well. So it's not quite a straight you know, electric, we have 30,000 electric meters, but I think there's another four or 5,000 water meters that could participate in this as well. <clears throat> well, this has been, this has been very helpful. Um, question for, for Mike. Um, I know that if we want to do a bond, we have to go to the town. Yep. Does that also, I can try to remember if it apply, what approvals we need if we're doing a loan, a bank loan. 
Yeah, any money we borrow in excess of 12 months has to go through That's regulatory and local approval. Yeah. So the, the legal question becomes if it's built into a contract with VEPSA, so we're charging you instead of $3.96 a month, it's $5 a month per meter, um, and the loan is on our books, does that change how you have to get approvals on your side? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer, but we'd need That's to look at it. like question. Nope. Well, then, then we probably need PUC approval because it would be, it would yes. be a similar kind of long-term contract that we... We're, I, I mean, can if describe... We're, 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 if we're incurring a big long-term obligation, I don't think it really... I think my... I, I'm speaking for myself now. I think... Um, I think that's something that we need to have buy-in from 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 the town. Um, if we can't if we can't convince folks that this is that this makes sense to do, um, then then we have a we have a we have a problem. Yeah, would would you guys be uh, supplying us with a, a marketing campaign <laughs> <laughs> to convince the ratepayers? <laughs> if if that's the desire we're certainly happy to help well i think if we see what the benefits are then then we're in a position to be talking about what the benefits are to ratepayers yeah um if 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 they're you know if there's if there's reasonably solid stuff there if there isn't then it's 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 a more difficult thing to to justify just one more question about operationally mike i mean would this this would help locate uh, or identify, locate, and then fix outages uh, more easily, correct? Yes. As well as, you know, system inadequacies. So if we're getting alarms on uh, circuit seven, tap nine, and we end up finding out, oh, we have a section of really small conductor in there that's dropping the voltage, Boy, we could replace that for a couple thousand bucks and uh, really improve our services here to this customer. You know, we don't know that good. right now. That's huge. And yeah, that's what we're talking about about the Burlington experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Any well, other? Thank questions? you, gentlemen. Yes. Thank thanks. You so much. Well, thanks for all thanks. the time. Sorry we ran so late. It's, uh... well, <laughs> there's a lot to cover. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye now. <clears throat>
motion is that that Mike is empowered to sign an auditor's letter with A.M. Peich in the form of the document that's been presented to us, except that the first full paragraph on page three should be deleted. Must be. <clears throat> and there was a second, but I didn't hear who had seconded it. I second it. Okay. Um, you want to say there, something, Brooke? It's a tie. Before you vote on it, um, there is a requirement for governance to sign as well as management. So I just want you to be clear that you're not um, giving him, are you giving him signatory authority for governance signature? I don't think that's a good idea. Perhaps it could be um, reworded to say um, that you're asking Mike to um, respond with a proposal to eliminate one paragraph um, and to come to the, the final contract with the auditors so that it is ready for signature by management and governance. Instead of authorizing him to sign the letter, if you know, ask him to prepare the letter sign. with yeah. the yeah. appropriate terms for signature. Well, I think we're doing more than that because if there is a letter on appropriate terms, then we are authorizing the signature, both the management signature and the governance signature. I think it, I'm just. I think it is a better practice to have governance actually sign the document. That's not what, I, Brooke, you're not hearing what I was saying. Okay. Okay. For, for a governance signature, there has to be a board decision to sign the document. So, Roger, do you want to retract your motion? <laughs> My motion. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So what, what, what I think we need is a motion that authorizes Mike to discuss with, with Paish and get the letter revised in the way that we've discussed by taking out the, paragraph, the first full paragraph on page three. And that subject to that being done authorizes Mike to sign as management and authorizes any member of the board to sign as manage as governance. Because we need, I think we need both. I move, uh, was that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was, it was very concise. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I move, I move to empower uh, Mike to negotiate with Paish to remove the, a problematic paragraph related to email and, and, and liabilities uh, to develop the engagement letter uh, to be signable by both Mike and, the, and uh, any member of the board. I'll second that. Okay. All, is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Hearing none, <clears throat> it was passed. Perfect, thank you, Brooke. Thanks very much, Brooke. Happy New Thanks. Year. Have a nice, nice night, bye-bye. Yeah, bye. -bye. See Okay, uh, which takes us to the financial update and preliminary budget review. Um, yes. And I guess the question is, at, are there, do people have any questions, any specific questions? Um, yeah, so okay. we're ready for questions on the financials but we're not ready for any questions on the budget till next meeting. All right.
I, I'm sorry, Michael, did you have a question? No. I, oh, I, I, I didn't know if you would raise your hand. Right. Uh, I have one question. Um, okay. I should know the answer to this. Um, and it's, it's, it, it goes to the, um, the, the general ledger report. It's Potterville Hydro. Which dam is that? Wolcott. Oh, Potterville is Wolcott. Okay. Yeah. Is there uh, where believe it or not, there was a guy, the first guy that built a hydro there was named Potter. And he actually owned the village there that consisted of like 12 houses and he provided power to those 12 houses. <laughs> Potter, Potterville was in, uh, in um, It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, I don't uh, know, but that's the origin of it. <laughs> and what was the era? What era are you talking about? Probably around 1900 or? That was right around uh, 1890. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I wondered because there were Wolcott Hydro references, but there wasn't that. And there was also a really, it's a small amount. I'm just, this is just curiosity. But there's an amount that, that's payable to VEPSA and its description is printer. Oh yeah, so yeah, if we uh, have a network printer that they need to set up, et cetera, I'll pick it out and let them buy it, and then they just bill me back for it. Oh, so it's okay. right there. They pro, you know, they get it all set up and come install it for it. Okay, uh, I just didn't think printers were in Vips's purview. It's no, no, that's just a reimbursement. Um, and yes. and the last question, uh, the the fees to to Primer that. Um, for almost ten thousand uh, dollars that are listed as solar project, is that the uh, conservation easement stuff? Yes, that okay. and I also had Eli working has have had Eli working on the um, Perizo stuff. So there's a couple thousand bucks in that too. The tree issue. I'm sorry, my uh, my connection uh, broke up. It was what, yeah. what was. Besides so, the so probably 2,500 of that is into the tree removal issue with the customer. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. So it's, it was just all listed as solar project. That's, that's yeah. fine. Any other questions on that? Uh, just in a three-year comparison, may, I might be thinking about this incorrectly, but um, in 2021, uh, it's one point, the net income is 1.176. 147 and the difference between that and the prior year are 625 and uh, just basing it on the the uh, the settlement amount closer to a million that means that the the net we income didn't a million. we didn't get a million okay we had to pay a third of the fees oh right okay uh, that, okay right. that, that accounts for most of it yeah yep. all right okay it was uh because it was short you know Four hundred thousand or so. So it's it's, yep. it's yeah okay. Brooke had to be paid <laughs> if we won. They earned it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else on the financials? If not, it takes us to the general manager's report. Any uh, questions? You know, how, how many of the variances are a result that the high variances are a result of accounting changes? Um, like where where are you talking about? Uh, let's see. I'm just looking at the the uh, operating statement. There, there are numbers. There are a number of variances that are fairly high, but it looks like things are being moved from one account to another. For example, you know and. That's a note I have, and I don't have any specific examples, so I, I never mind. I, ret I retract that because I can't. Oh, but that, that's you're right, Vince, and and uh, Roger identified that last month and asked the same question, and and you're right. So <clears> that was, was shuffles uh, that Pish had us implement. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Anything else on financials? If not. We go to the general manager's report. So Beth, you're welcome to stay on and chit chat, but you 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 can go if you'd like as well. I'd like to listen in. Okay, great. You're more than welcome. Thank you. 
We enjoy your company. <laughs> yeah, because I'm quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had um, this this whole uh, flap with that customer. Yeah. Uh, no, that last email that you sent out. Um, whew. So yeah, when he sent that, we we Eli and I talked on the phone, and we both blocked him. So he can't communicate with us via email anymore. Uh, appalling. Yeah. Um, I, I, what yeah. started that, Mike? Well, that's what I, that's uh, what I'm getting to because I think it was okay. it was clear. I mean, I think. Let me see if I got this right. Okay. From, from the email chain, <laughs> that he owed some money and he was selling <clears> his property because this person is no longer a customer. Is <clears> right. right. So he you're part. You're part Right. So he bought a house in Hardwick. That customer that sold to him ended up leaving a bill of $140 on their account. So he got a generic letter from Hardwick Electric saying, uh, and he turned around like two weeks later and sold the property again. Okay. So he bought it and sold it. He just flipped it. And the lien, because he was the new guy on the account, inadvertently went to him. It should have gone to the prior owner. That was all resolved before he even re received his letter. And it was paid when he went off the handle. It was, there's no issue. And but but I, I, I just wonder, as, as a customer <laughs> relations matter, when we send a lien letter, when it's resolved, maybe we should just send a, a, a letter out saying that it's been resolved. Sure, we can do that. And, and I don't know that that would have made. Uh, actually, we do, Lynn. We do, we do send one out. Yeah, that's, we have a standard letter that says, oh, your lien has been released because I sign those all the time. Well, did this guy get it? I, don't, I think this all happened before that could have happened. Yeah, this was so fast. Yeah. Um, but, but. So normally, yes, we do. Well, and maybe we should still be sending him that letter, but um, I, I can do that. Um, I think Eli already. I don't want to. No, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, raise, raise anything else with him. I mean, he's. <laughs> oh God. He's, he's horrible. Yeah. He's, he's a sociopath. He's out there. Yeah. Um. So that was that was one thought. Um. Then the other thing that was in here was uh, the select board meetings, uh, which I know Mike wanted to um, <clears throat> do the dates. I, I told them that I would give them a stiff, uh, firm schedule uh, last month, and I forgot all about it. I, I can go this month, any month, it doesn't matter. But, uh, well, I do we want like having you all attend? Are people prepared to, to pick dates or we want to do that at the next meeting? Well, the next meeting is a bit of a question mark too. Well, the next, what well, our next meeting is, I'm trying to pull up the calendar. Our next meeting will be on February one, two, we'll be on, yes. <laughs> we keep picking holidays. Is February, is President's Day. Um, which is after this is is after that um, select board meeting. Could we just uh, let's see? Could we just bump oh, it? Oh, I'm in the wrong. Hang on, I'm in the wrong year. I was. In, I don't know why it flipped to 2023, um, which may be the same for February as 2022. But um, 21st. Yeah. So we're still meeting on President's Day. You know, the way we've got this set up, we're going to be meeting on President's Day and King's birthday pretty much every year. And we really shouldn't. We sh you know. It's your meeting. We can do it whenever you want. Well, just remember, we had also considered um, if Beth yeah. feels like she can have the monthly statements done by the fourth. Uh, yeah, we I, I can speak to that, Roger. Yeah. Yeah. So I went back through uh, 20, 2021. Uh -huh. And we do, in fact, get the get the VEPSA summary reports uh, on Thursday or Friday after our meeting consistently, th usually Thursday, but once in a while on Friday. And 
those would not leave enough time for us to get everything else together and give you enough time to review for Monday. Okay. And there's no speeding up the end at VEPSA because that all, everything they're waiting on comes from ISO and the tail isn't gonna wag that dog. Okay. Yeah, we don't need to make it. Oh, we did look at it. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, in any case, the, the 17th is before our next meeting. So. Um, Does that matter? No, 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 I, I just, uh, I was just. Oh, for just, discussion's for sake. For dis no, no for, for somebody, I can do it. No, I'd rather not, but from March on, just put me on the schedule every five times or whatever you want to do. Okay. Can somebody Rather than our naming dates, I'll just say from March on, I'll do my share. Well, I know, we know that, but I told them I'd give them a schedule. They okay, well, okay I, can, but I can do the, I can do the, I can do February 17th. I can do March. Yeah, I can do March or April. Okay. Well, do we yeah. have Michael can do March? Yeah. Then Vince can do April. Yep. Then just you know, two, two some months. You can roll me into May, and I, I, you know, I may as I don't have control or visibility to my calendar that far ahead. I may need to ask somebody for a, a trade. Yeah. If you end up, if anybody ends up yeah. with a conflict, yeah. I will always yeah. go. Yeah. So go ahead and. Go ahead and just equitably allocate them. I'll take, I'll take that month. Okay. Then I'm going to put that. You're going to be sure. June. You're June. Okay. And then yep. we'll start over. Same order. Mike Sullivan, Zeno, Vince, Roger, Nat. I'll get that out and email out to everybody. Okay. Perfect. And as always, we love to have your little notes about what to say. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's points. essential. Yeah. No problem. Okay. And then there was the email that was sent. I'm sorry. Is there anything else on the general manager's report? I will take silence as there isn't. So then we go on to uh, the solar event. And this is our added item, agenda item. Yeah, this is our added agenda item. Okay. Um, so the 30th, I'm not available other than that. 30th is, uh, the 30th of May is Memorial Day. We shouldn't do something. Like I'm not available on the um, 18th of April. Did everybody get that email? Yeah, you sent it to everybody. Yep. Right. Yeah. I, I, yep. said, I, I meant to send it to everybody. Um, I got it. And, and the 2nd of April is Eid. I, I, you know, I don't know that it affects anybody, but just sort of on principle, I don't like the idea of scheduling something on Eid. Does the 23rd work for everybody of May? That was my father's Sure. Question. If he were alive, he would be 102 years old. Uh, 30, 30, 23rd of May is fine for me. Yep. Yep. I'm just, we might get lucky and have a nice sunny day and be able to go right down to the site because I think it'll be dried out by then. So that was my thought. Yeah, no, I think uh, later is better. You have a group mountain bike from, from Hazen Union. Yeah. I'll meet you down there. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say speak for yourself. We Lynn, I'll hike. pick you up. <laughs> we can have a hike. Okay, so I'll propose to Julia the 23rd. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> what time of day generally would it be? I don't think they've gotten that far yet. OK. 
Okay. Um, is there a is there any other business? Have we, have we finalized the day we're meeting with BEPSA to go over their value of public power interviews? Uh, yeah. No, we moved a lot. I thought it we was, did. I thought we did too. Hang on, Michael. I'll find I'll find it and I'll send okay. you. Okay. Great. I think I want to say it's the twenty fourth, but I wouldn't stake my life on it. Oh, hang on. I just pulled up my calendar. Silly me. Um. Yes, the 24th at 11 a.m. Okay. Perfect. I assume that's going to be a Zoom. I guess, yep. yeah. Yeah. So I just want to mention, <clears throat> apropos AMI, I'm not convinced on the finances. So I would love to have you, I guess, Mike, put together at some point just a short list of where you think there are savings for Hardwick Electric. I mean, obviously there's no meter man. Obviously there can be help locating problems, but boy, I don't see very many ways in which you're gonna save money. But I'd love to see your list. I thought the list in our packet was really thin and not helpful. Okay. And I'll just say we, we don't lose a meter reader. We still need a meter reader. So. That's not a savings. Yeah. Well, he doesn't go. He doesn't go out. He'd have yep. other. He'll, he'll other still have readers. plenty to do. He'll have disconnects, reconnects, reread, check reads, right. head meters. He has to go replace. Yeah, there's there's still plenty of work. Well, the disconnects well, and reconnects. I, I thought were going to be done remotely. That was what I thought one of the benefits was. Actually, you're right. I'm, you're right. That is a remote. Uh, so you can't, you can't change a meter remotely. Right. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the big, one of the big um, sales, you know, savings that was supposed to come about at CVPS was, well, we're not going to need all these meter readers. Well, I ended up keeping over half of them. So. <laughs> and Burlington Electric has obviously done this for a number of years. And do you know of some other utilities? Yep. So Burlington Electric did it. Stowe Electric did it. Uh, CVPS, GMP did it. They all did it with uh, federal funding in a similar program to this ARPA. Um, Which reduced their price by as 50, much as 50. 50%. Yeah. So CVs was six, a $63 million project and they got 30, what, $31.5 million dollars subsidized Whew. that's huge yeah so uh vermont electric co-op has a power line carrier ami system that i installed for them way back when and i don't believe that was part of any funding they just did it and mm -hmm. washington electric also has a power line carrier system uh a cooper eaton system which is probably the the worst option of any AMI system mm. there is, in my opinion, but uh, those those are the five. So these are signals going through the actual power line. Yep. No. So they, at the at every zero crossing of voltage in the sine wave, they have a device that actually pulses the meters or receives data from the meters at that zero crossing when there's zero voltage on the line. Huh. I mean, you know, one of the proposed uh, advantages of an AIMI system is this whole uh, demand and use uh, issue. But I mean, you say in Greensboro, 90% of the users are residential and they're all going to be about the same. And so I have my doubts about the advantages. I, I'm not sure what you mean by they're all going to be about the same, but that's. Well, there. Residential is residential. residential Their peaks yeah. and these are about the same. Each but each it, of the people, each of the houses. But it, it depends no, what they not, have for loads not. in their home. They're they're not. There are people who 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 are at home all the time. There are people who go out. You know, who are working away. There are people who with you know, people have different schedules. Um, there are people yeah. with children without children. It it um, there there's there's variation. And you, you know the. the 
be an education component to that too, just making people aware of it, that they can change the uh, heating cycle of their electric heater, water heater, for example. You know, but I mean, just, would we really be going that direction? Well, you well, can it, do it. It's you to take different rates. There different be, rates for different times of day. At some point, we will likely go that route. Stowe yes. certainly. <laughs> yes. Not we're for everybody. Have. Not for everybody. But but Stowe, if you look at if you go on Stowe Electric's website, you'll see there's a whole bunch of different rates, all different kinds of rates. Um, the the the, the thing of it is is that if if we're raising costs, of, yeah. you know, the month plus whatever you know it's four dollars a month plus right um there's got to be for what to just exactly 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 um you know and if we're not you know <laughs> what concerns me you know it's great to say you know we're going to be you know the commission at some point is going to require this that'll but, be a while but they haven't and it's you know if we're in the position where we're forced to do it by the regulator then that's the story that we're telling our customers we don't have a choice in this yeah right but if we have a choice and we can't justify it that's 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 a different story and so i think we really need to see we need a better handle on the cost because those numbers on after year, you know year two did not jive with a well and it, we're, we're not talking jump change here this is a lot of money yeah right? well, yeah that's for sure and, and, and most of it's right up front. Yep. Well, presumably that, you know, to the extent that we finance it over time, that spreads the right. cost out over time, um, which reduces the rate shock. I mean, we can't, you know, right. we can't, we yep. can't That's... do a, we, we could not do a lump sum increase, even if we had the cash to do it. We right. couldn't go in for that kind of a of a of a of a rate increase in one shot. That's, that's, right. that's what that's two million. Well, the the up the first year cost was close to two million dollars, and our annual revenue is what five million. Yep. So five and a half. That's forty percent. Yeah. I mean, it just you know you you can't you can't do that. Um, so our, our total uh, revenues are six and a half million. Six and a half. Sorry, um, but still. I mean, everything Absolutely. changes if we, got, yeah. if we get 30 or 40 percent uh, help from the state, that changes everything a lot. Yeah. Otherwise, so, I'm skeptical. Well, that's why I think we need to see the detail that's in in that report. Um, and um, and and to the extent that, you know. And Jackie's maybe, really good, too. So. If you guys want to have her come and present, she she knows <laughs> every needle in that haystack. But I, I think I think Matt's point, Mike, if is legitimate, maybe, is 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 maybe you go through the benefits that she's got in her report and give us some color on them. This this you think is is real and it's a hard number. Yep. This you think is, you know, maybe we'll get that, maybe we won't. You know, that would be that would be helpful. I can do that, no problem. Yeah, I, like yeah, I think where you're going is that there has to be a set of savings numbers that Mike um, can sign up for that he believes in with his experience. It's, in other words, it's great to have VEPSA doing a lot of the legwork on this, but ultimately before we pull the trigger on it, we got to know that Mike Mike's buying into it. Yep. Our numbers Very have to be our numbers, yeah. And that's on, the, that's on that's implementation right. and savings, I think, you know, I since agree. they're looking at that. But I think a nine year, you know, the numbers that they had a nine year payback on, <laughs> on a 15 year, in, on something that's gonna last for 15 years, no one would do that. Well, I don't know, that's as bad as my solar panels. So yeah, yeah but, but okay, <laughs> but, 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 that's, that's a, but that's, there are other reasons that you do that. I, yeah. I should say, I, I would I'm doubt not, there, yeah. that, that, that as a business decision, I don't think that would be a commonly. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so anyway, 
any other business? I had one question about nuclear power. I know both the- uh, We're not people. putting in nukes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did just quick. <laughs> no radiation, no radiation. Uh, just the, the, neither the climate action plan nor, while well, they both characterize nuclear power as carbon free, are they? Yeah, they, it is. It, uh, that, that's an accurate statement. It is, well, I, I, and not just characterized, but also that the the climate uh, that uh, power purchases should be carbon free rather than um, uh, renewable, and and, and the defining which. I mean, I, I I haven't read it closely enough, but uh, Mike, uh, do you know if that? Uh, uh, this, this, is the, this is the exact reason that we have delayed and BEPSA has delayed progressing with replacing or renewing our existing Seabrook block. And we are waiting on the legislature to answer okay. that exact question, whether or not uh, we're gonna be able to get recs for non-carbon and not necessarily renewable or not. And if we can, then I think we're probably gonna be re-upping with uh, the Seabrook project because their pricing is just phenomenal. Well, even with that, are you, you, is there a, Rex, it may, well, it makes sense. Right. I mean, are you able to get Rex some other way? Yeah. That's all that we're waiting for the on answer the, on yeah. what, how Rex, how Rex and nukes are going to intertwine or not. It, are, are we lobbying? Is VEPSA lobbying for counting nukes as, as? Oh, everybody is. So is Green Mountain yeah. Power. Yeah, they, they have a bunch of Seabrook. Well, time is <clears throat> time's going by. We, <laughs> we got uh, to buy that pretty soon. Yeah, we got about uh, 10 months, I think, before it starts to drop off. Okay. Yep. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? I so move. So move, we adjourn. Time for dinner. Any <laughs> objection? <laughs> Hearing none, we are adjourned at 7.37. Okay, thank you all. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Bye. Stay, stay well. Thanks, Bye. See you later.